Right on. James Brandon Lewis, man. Thanks for joining yes. me, bro. I really hey, thanks appreciate for, it. Th thanks for having me. And I uh, appreciate your work. Seriously. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you, man. Mm -hmm. When I listen to your sound, um, I hear a, a, a flow channeled mm -hmm. from a from a special place. Right. And and I hear melody. I hear angles. Mm -hmm. I, I don't always know where it's going to go, but man, I trust you. And it always right. ends up happening. And, and that. man, I, I want to know, is there anything you work on to build trust and integrity, number one, with your band, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever formation that you have, and number right. two, with the listener, how do you develop that sense of integrity and, and, and trust? I think it's just a matter of time and hanging out, you know, hanging out with the elders, hanging out with different people, William Parker, Matthew Shipp, Farone Akhlaf, with Dada Leo Smith. Um, that's the first thing, to just build that, you know, what I would call a little touch of that cast iron skillet, you know? And then, you know, I like, a, I think presenting a melody, you know, that's, that's always, I mean, that's, that's a, a one of the proven formulas, you know, to, to bring, to bring in the audience. Mm -hmm. But then also I like a playful dance, you know, where I, where I give the audience some and then I take some ah. and then event, and eventually it's going back and forth. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, okay, he's trying to have a conversation with me, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to bring the listener into this headspace. Um, of course, that's after the music is already recorded, rehearsed or whatever, but that's what I hope is happening mm -hmm. and um but no that's that's I'll, i'm always i always lean on respect i think respect is important is an important feature um just in general whatever you're trying to present you mm -hmm. know in in out in between outside whatever you want to call it just if you're 110 percent honest with yourself you know being yeah. who you are it, it comes across because that's you can't hide behind music. I'm learning this the, the older I get. You can't hide behind it. You know, it's it's you know when I was in my in my teens and early twenties, it was always like, yeah, man, I'm I, I'm using whatever was going on in life. It was more of like, yeah, I got to use music to escape. But then, as I got older, you know, just dealing with life issues, problems, you know, the joys, happinesses, you know, I always lean on music. Then the older I get, the more I realize. It's actually not an escape from, it's an escape to. And then, and then mm. that exposes. Mm. Now, you're, now you're exposed. You know, it's like, it's like, you know, the old, the old school where it's like, you know, you can't play about love if you never experienced it. You know, and that's with, that's actually, that saying is with anything, you know, in life. We could talk about anything, you know, and a sense of, a sense of angles that you say, man, Last few years, I think about Barry Sanders, to okay. be honest. Okay. You know, because okay. then it's like, because he's like stopping and starting at different points. So on the horn, if I'm thinking about the line, if it's a descending or ascending, you know, I'm thinking not necessarily always conscious of the angles, but point, being very pointillistic, like, but, you know, and just keeping it shifty, you know, mm. but definitely, but definitely intention, intentional for sure. Um, and of course, I practice the basics like anybody, you know, sound, scale, um, and whatever else is required, you know. And I think, I think the the way the music is presented to the band is just, you know, there's a melody, and it's pretty basic, pretty, mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. still you still using Western notation and that kind of thing. Um, and then we just, I allow the the thing is giving the the freedom to allowing every individual in the ensemble to express who they are because they're at home practicing their own ways of being regardless true, of me. So true. why would I want to like harness, you know, I always lean on like the, one of the greatest, in my opinion, and I think about this now, but one of the greatest uh, kind of compositional flaws I ever did was writing Jamal Adin to Kuma bass lines. He doesn't mm. need me to write anything. Mm. He doesn't need, you know, like, mm. Yeah, it was hip hop. Days of Freeman was hip hop. It was a certain vibe, but and of course he's a professional. He had no problems with the baseline, but 
his voice, his instrument. He knows where, how it lays and everything. So I think Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's just growth through the years of dealing with people like, hey, you know, just present something and then let the music flow. Let them take it, you know? Because when you start, like with anything, you start trying to control, like even if you're in a relationship or, you know, whatever, you know, it, it ceases to be spontaneous, you know, romantic, you know, it's like, man, this cat is controlling, you know? So, <laughs> you know, so dig. you gotta be, gotta be smooth with it, you know? Dig, dig. Yeah. Dude, I love that. Yeah. I love that, James. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thanks, man. Man, I was, I was, um, reading up on you just a little bit and I mm-hmm. remembered that you were from Buffalo, uh, yeah. man. Uh, you know, I, I think about Grover Washington. I think about mm-hmm. Dr. Lonnie Smith, you know, yeah. about that. um, man, we have something in common. Um, my, mm-hmm. my father was also clergy and okay. Uh, okay. man, I, I, I came to the music early on as well, actually mm-hmm. through his collection. Uh, he oh, made wow. no, no bones about, Hey man, there's not a duality here. Um, there's this is a salad bowl. This is all right, together. right. So continue, uh-huh. continue. Uh-huh. You there, know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Man. And man, when I first heard you, I'm like, man, this cat, James Brandon Lewis, he he gets it, and he gets it in a way. In our generation, I don't often hear a lot of African American brothers taking the lineage of someone like Albert Eiler. And relating that to um, the melodic strains of mm-hmm. what gospel in the church was. And mm-hmm. obviously, man, you get that right yeah, away. For sure. Man, for sure. tell me just about working through um, spiritual music, mm-hmm. some of that lingo in Albert Eiler, and how right. you came to develop your concept of what it right. means to be holistic in this, right. in this music. Well, I will say this. First off, I think that. I'm at a place now of finally finding the synthesis of all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, it took me a while to not compartmentalize it. You know, like if I pick up my horn and I'm playing, I need the every hour, for instance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, when I was living in Colorado, uh, I was a member of a uh, Zion Baptist Church. And that was the song that was required of me to play before the minister would preach. Mm-hmm. And it took me a while because that's a specific sound. That is a specific uh, vocabulary. That's a way of knowing, you know, that even though it's instrumental, the audience, you know, I need the old, I need the, you know, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. they know that. Yeah. So if yeah. you vary, if you vary it, it's it's not too much varying you can do, you know. Um, but mm-hmm. I have been playing gospel music. You know, Buffalo is a beautiful melting pot of everything, funk, soul, gospel. And I was playing back when I was in high school, mm-hmm. even before high school, you know, there was a group, Allen and Allen. Mm-hmm. I used to have my own band um, that was modeled after just piano and sax. And then Angela Christie, you know, I was, mm-hmm. that was one of my first influences on, on, uh, on alto sax, you know, mm-hmm. before. You know, I, of course, Charlie Park was the first, my first, but I always wanted to find those connections within the music, you know, of, okay, while I'm playing this, well, who are the people playing the sax mm-hmm. who are, who, who can maybe be my indirect mentor while I'm at church? And then it had all these other things. And so eventually, um, you know, I, I played gospel music unbeknownst to a lot of people, but I have been playing this my whole, just my whole life. Mm-hmm. Um, especially you figure early 2000s, about 2006, 2007, mm-hmm. I was living in Colorado and I was playing nothing but hymns and gospel music after I graduated from undergrad at Howard University. Wow. But I'm trying to figure out life, you know, th- mm-hmm. there was, you know, my generation, I feel like my generation is the generation where the magical phone call is to join a band is that's that's few and far between so i had to kind of figure it out you know figure it out and i was playing in big bands and got an opportunity to um open up for albertina walker i was i won the singers and musicians conference in 2000 dorinda clark cole so a lot of this is a lot of history 
unbeknownst to a lot of people. Yeah. And so that was a spe- that was a specific thing, right? And so I was on this path and this trajectory, and there was a there was a moment where I was playing "I Want Jesus to Walk with Me," and I decided that I was going to vary it because I was tired of playing it a certain way. Mm-hmm. And I remember, you know, if you want to know about audience, I think the best uh-huh. place, in my opinion, is church. Is church because you get that. It's not like direct, like you shouldn't do that. It's kind of indirect. And I remember an elder coming to me after I was buried, after I buried it. And she said, um, she said, you know, let the Lord use you. And I didn't take that as a critique. I took it as, okay, the kinds of exploration. Mm -hmm. It's just not the environment that's appropriate for that exploration. So I never, but I never forgot about that, which inspired me to then want to further my education. And then, um, you know, I, I learned about Albert Eiler and well, briefly, I, first off, I knew about Odin Pope when I was in school Yeah, because we have this place called, we had this place in Buffalo called um, Hall Walls. And so, but we weren't, see in Buffalo, like it's a melting pot. So these strict divisions of what, what this music and this music, this is, doesn't really exist. You know, it's like, okay, we had the rock show. Okay, we had the funk show. We had, mm-hmm. we had an avant-garde show. We're not calling it that. So I had a lot of experiences prior to my um, exit um, and leaving Buffalo to Howard. And then later on in life, you know, the Charles Gales, the Dewey Redmonds, you know, David S. Ware, and just the whole continuum, you know, mm-hmm. over, over COVID, I was checking out, I was checking out Bill Barron. Yeah. And I was checking out Teddy Edwards and Sonny Chris. So it's just, I'm always learning and trying to get the, the sound palette. It's not about genre, but it's about the sound palette, the timbre, like, okay, what makes this player, what, what, what makes a, an Arnett Cobb mm-hmm. different than a, than Illinois Jacquet, yeah, you know, like, like, yeah. and, and then, so that's with all of the things, you know, if I put on, if I put on Frank Wright and Frank Lowe, so it's about the, learning the whole thing. And then where, where do you find yourself within the whole thing? Yeah. And then trying to practice that. So, um, so yeah, I was playing gospel music and then that eventually that led me to want to uh, go to the California Institute of Arts to pursue my, my graduate studies. Cause I felt mm-hmm. like, you know, I'm a young 20 some, I still haven't figured it out. So, Mm-hmm. And I was playing in big bands and doing the gospel music and I could have been on that path, but then that wouldn't have allowed me the same amount of depth to, to explore, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and I was aware of, you know, um, Angela Christie, Alan Allen, of course, Kirk Way alum. Then you have, um, what was it? Uh, Bernard Johnson. Is that, is that the guy's name? He's like Dr. Bernard. Something. Oh, he, he plays, he plays, he plays sax. Okay. This was before Angela Christie, you know, and, and would do a lot of the, uh, um, you know, the National Baptist uh, conferences, okay. yeah, like back in the day. So yeah, so so eventually I ended up at Cal Arts. Um, I was able to play spirituals. I was able to play jazz. I was able to play everything. You know, I met with Donalia Smith, Charlie Hayden. Um, when I got to the school, it was so refreshing, actually. And uh-huh. and of course, when I was at Howard, when I was at Howard. That was a specific education as well. You know, Thad Jones, Mel Lewis, yeah. you know, uh, of course, the Howard Gospel Choir, different things. And I was playing all kinds of music still, though. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't limiting myself. I was in a Howard Jazz Ensemble. And that's how I got my first professional experiences, actually. We, wow. we, um, we toured Japan. Uh-huh. We also, uh, the year that I graduated, or maybe the year before, mm-hmm. we played at the Kennedy Center Honors, okay. back in John Legend, Katie Lang. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's like a lot of, a lot of, a lot of a lot of meat and potatoes there uh-huh. but but i think that eventually i started to hear like really hear my sound and how i can synthesize all of these things together mm-hmm. and then of course you know early on you know listening to train to albert eiler to listening to to gene ammons you know that album the preacher you know what i mean isn't that so, great <laughs> i mean it's great right so i think just having yeah. that finding learning you know that's why i always try to stress to young people who ask me questions 
learn yourself, map, map yourself and what, who do you see yourself in? And then like whatever that natural tendency is, meaning, mm-hmm. meaning the thing before the taught understanding of what the thing is, mm-hmm. you know, you're, you're already doing it. And then you say, mm-hmm. it's just like the first time I was, I start listening to Gene Ammons and I said, wow, you know, yeah. or Hank Jones, you know, just finding myself within specific sound uh, palette, you know, of, of like, you know, like for me, I would always try to find like little things that kind of represent a sound palette that I was hearing as a kid, like, you know, uh, Junior Cook, right? You know, that's a specific sound. Or because I'm from Buffalo and gravitating towards Groove, of course I listen to Grover. You cannot be from Buffalo and not listen to him. That's just what it is, yeah. especially when you're a young person. And some of his family members used to go to my church. Wow. You know? wow. So it's just all these different things. So I'm sitting there as a kid and it's like, okay, funky. So then that kind of funk sound would lead me to, you know, if we're talking about, um, what's my group with the Joe Sample, Wilton Felder? Oh, the Crusaders. The Crusaders. Yeah. Live at the Lighthouse, 1966. Yeah, man. yeah. You see? Yeah. You see? So, so, so then you go there, and then you go to Soul Live. They from Buffalo. Mm-hmm. You see? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you go, and then, so for, so as far as funk is concerned, that's kind of, that's breathing where I'm from. It's a groove town. You know, you got, you got the Andy DeFranco's, you got the Google guys, you got Rick James, you got, you know, you know, Junie Booth, you, know? Mm. you got, you, you see, you got all of these different sounds, yeah. but, it, but then see, I don't even think, you know, like, you know, I've never heard any musicians, even some of the elders I play would say, you know, now nah, we're going out. Mm. I think it was just, mm. just a natural progression, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, I mean, sorry to be long winded, but no, I, I, love I just, it. Yeah, I I just love think it. that, I just think that like, when I started to become comfortable with, okay, here are all my sounds. And then like, I'm be honest, man, my grandma, my grandparents, you know, my grandmothers, I want them to be able to listen to my music. I don't care about a lot. Of, I don't care about a lot of people liking it or not liking it because that's a part of life. You know, I think that if you're okay with putting, presenting yourself, music, then you should be okay with a good or bad criticism. But when a grandma, if I'm playing my stuff with my grandma and she said, oh yeah, I like that one, then I'm good with life. Yeah. Because <laughs> because that is like, you know, you know, like I can ask my grandmother, you know, okay, what do you well, what do you think about this? Like one time she said to me, well, when are you going to start playing calm music again? Hmm. I said, <laughs> I said, well, I understood where she was coming from because, you know, it's sort of like, there's been a few albums where it's just energy. The point is energy. The point is not to be theoretically correct. That's not the point. The point is like, almost like a mm-hmm. punk rock aesthetic, you know, with my trio. It was, yeah. it was, we were coming from, we was coming from like a hip hop punk, like kind of like in your face. If I would, you know, if I was to critique my own, like if I was to critique, critique every album, it's more like, you know, and then Unruly Manifesto, that was still in that vibe, you know, even though there, even though it's melody rich. I, I, I feel like I've recently had a discussion with myself, right? Mm-hmm. I was like, well, if nothing else in this life, if I'm not the deepest or the most theoretical or whatever the thing is of the day, I think I have a hold on that I I naturally hear melody and melodies, you know? And sometimes I can't give folks the deep answer because it it's not. Sometimes it's like like George Washington Carver. They asked him, they said, hey, they said, uh, they said, hey, how'd you get all these theories? Mm-hmm. You know, well, how'd you come up with all these things? He said, I talked to the plants. Mm-hmm. What a, well, the same thing is if somebody said, well, how do you come up with these melodies? And I said, well, hey, I woke up and the creator gave them to me. Would you believe me? You know, <laughs> that's the thing, right? So I think, uh, I, I just, 
I don't want to say no to any experience is the net of it. I don't tell myself no mm-hmm. on my curiosity. And I don't feel, um, I don't feel any pulling from any specific way. Although my greed vibration is the people I've been playing with, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you, mm-hmm. elder, elders and mentorship is important. You yes, know, sir. when I met Matthew, when I met Matthew Ship and he introduced me to William, I, f- I felt like finally I found my agreed vibration. When I met with Dot, I felt the same thing. Ferrona Cloth, Mark Rebo, you know, different people, Thurston Moore, different people I've worked with over the years. But I be, I'm, but I've been quiet about it because I don't need to be like, well, I do this and I do this, I do this. It's the same thing. I met Mar- Mary Baraka. Mm-hmm. I opened up for a Mary Baraka St. Mark's Church. What was it? Two thousand. I think 13. Wow, man. Wow. And guess what? Hey, I was nervous as a mug. Given, the, <laughs> given he's one of the people who heard the whole continuum, he heard sure, sure. he heard everybody. He heard yeah. Albert Island. He heard John he Coltrane. So my, so my thought process was, <laughs> what can I play at all? And, it was, mm. and I rarely, I rarely mm. think like that, but mm-hmm. with someone with his depth. Yeah. yeah. And so for him to say, good job after is like, all right, cool. I don't, I don't need nothing else. Right. Like everything else will just be icy. Right. Know? Right. And so, um, but yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's all one, man, to get back to your question. I think it's, I think it's all one. And I think it's a, a lived experience. Like I don't have to get on, I don't have to get on the phone with you and do an interview to say some stuff that I'm not living. It's, you know, like every day it's, it's how I live now, mm-hmm. you know, like I don't have to think about, how to do this or that or how to be myself i think that if i pick up the sax i better be myself because mm-hmm. i can't be I, and trust me i have tried <laughs> i was just like every other young person i i remember when i moved out to colorado man uh-huh, uh-huh. and i was I, you know my dad was living in colorado my mom's living in buffalo and uh-huh. and man i must have been talking about john coltrane and joshua redmond so much in my early 20s that my dad was like enough it was the first time ever as an artist right as an artist yeah that i was questioned in that way you know because he he said like well who are you who are you who, mm-hmm. who is my son musically mm-hmm. and that forced me to think about it because i never because before that you know i was in undergrad i'm playing with my friends you know we thinking we the next mint condition and you know, just the whole DC vibe, how right. I vibe, Neo Soul, that whole sure. thing, right? Yeah. So I'm thinking I'm on that path, like, yeah, you know. Mm-hmm. And then when that didn't happen, I had to go back to the drawing board, you know, and, and that takes time right. to put all that pressure on young people to know, to know, you got to know, you got to know. It's like, no, wait a second, you know? And so I think, you know, my parents were being supportive, like, okay, you don't know, mm-hmm. but here's the time to figure it out. And so I began to figure it out. Okay, am I gonna play? Am I gonna play hymns? Am I gonna be in the jazz ensemble? You know, am I going to join the union? Am I gonna go back to school? Am I, yeah. So I've had a, you know, am I gonna go work a job at a music festival? I did that too. You know, I did a lot of different sure. things in the sure. capacity of music to figure it out. But then once I moved to New York and just linking with this community and playing a lot of different types of music, is that I think that that it's okay to not know. Mm-hmm. But to but you, know, you got to ask yourself them hard questions, you know, and you got to be willing to. Mm. It's like, um, and I pull from all different sources, you know, George Washington Carter, Carver, um, yeah, yeah, Norman Lewis, yeah, Jack Whit and Abstract Expressionist folks. Mm-hmm. I mean, even you know, I pull from from people around me. I you know, I mean, there's it's once I remember checking out this one interview. For Roy Hargrove, where he says, if you're going to mm-hmm. be in it, you got to be all the way in it. Yeah, yeah. And I like that. You know, I like, it, it, it doesn't have to pertain to one specific thing. It's like, how can you use that and make it your own? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, man. But anyways, I hope that answered your question. No, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. You kind of led me a couple of different ways, but the- Right, the- right, right. I know. You see how my brain works, right? <laughs> I like it's it, like- <laughs> man. I like it. I like it, man. And it's and it's cool too because as you mentioned, George Washington Carver, mm-hmm. I do wanna I do wanna ask you about Jessup Wagon. 
Mm-hmm. Fantastic recording, man. Oh, Congratulations. Thank you. Um, but but I but I, I the thing that got me right away again when I looked up what the Jessup wagon was. Right. This is a mobile device that right. allows this genius to right. go into the community mm-hmm. and teach the people. Right. And as I think about what we've endured, COVID right. and pandemic. Right. Right. And what's next and getting back to work and all of right. these things. Right. How important, James, mm-hmm. for you is it to go to the people to give them the message? Oh, wow. I think it's, you know, I think. And how know, do we do that? That's an interesting question because I often ponder, um, you know, I'm, I've been affiliated with Arts for Art uh, organization here in New York that presents concerts in the community. I've also done things, um, played up at, um, I forget the name of this church up, up in Harlem with, with Craig Harris. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I've done a lot of different types of gigs. Um, I don't know if gigs are, are the only answer. I think that it's the dissemination of materials. I have young people reach out to me all the time and, you know, and it's not, you know, it's not always me trying to capitalize on whatever they're viewing, but more so like, yeah, let's have a conversation. I don't, I don't need a buck off of you. Yeah. Um, and during the COVID, I think that, that things got, I will say that, I mean, there, there is a part of me that has my own kind of, I'm like a hermit. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I, I don't always, I can work on that part of myself to push against my own uh, kind of sort of social quirks, anxieties or whatever. Um, but, but I've done different things, you know, when, when young people are reaching out to me, I'm just, I'm just open and honest with them. Mm. I think, the, I think that, I think the role that we should be at is being honest about, you know, well, what is making it in the music industry? And what is, um, you know, content, you know, what, what is, what is content? I think that it's cool to have a message. I think the sound, I think, I think your music, I think music can say everything that needs to say, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not a politician. Okay. And there are people who studied their whole lives and politicians. Yeah. However, being aware of what's, I try to, and that's what I try to do within each one of my own albums is leave a nugget for that curious person, for that young person who has that same curiosity I had to to go and say, well, why did this person, why did this person title this, this? Mm. You know, like I remember as a kid checking out uh, the Josh Redman album. I think he's got a tune called Groove X, I think. Mm-hmm. has X in there, mm-hmm. obviously a reference to Malcolm X, right? Sure, sure. And I said to myself, well, what is that? What is that reference? And then you go and you just, you start digging, you know, no different than hip hop people. You know, you start digging, you start, you start understanding how people are putting things together and asking the right questions. When I say the right questions, I mean, peeling back the layers that aren't being talked about. There's the there is the agreed narrative that we all hear via the appropriate channels of which you don't always know if it's real to the core of who you are mm-hmm. or if it's you know it's billion to billions of dollars being pumped into the way information is being disseminated so how do you how do you get the right info you know yeah. even even when we talk about covid it's sort of like okay, like I went on, I went and played a concert in Switzerland a couple weeks ago and recorded another, another new album. Wow, wow. The information being disseminated about the going, you know, the entry out and, you know, the exit out, entry back in, the people who were organizing, they had no clue. They did the best that they could do, but no one knows this is the way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think that I think that the reason why I've been a bit fascinated with history 
in the last few years and molecular biology and all these different things. It's because I'm searching for the answers I'm not hearing. Like, you know, you learn about George Watson Carver, you learn he wasn't just a peanut guy. Right, right. This dude was a monster, yeah. you know, of, of uh, just, you know, a painter could draw, could play an instrument. He was working with soybeans before it was even popular. Mm. He actually was, was a practicing vegetarian himself mm. before it was even a thing. Mm. So when you learn about that, you know, and then, you know, this is the technological age, right? So we should be able to find anything and everything. I got bulletins. I got bulletins. Supposedly mm. the bulletins that he was disseminating off of those, off of that uh, Jessup wagon. Uh -huh. educational bulletins you know how to nurture your soil different recipes you know because at the time you know the bow weevil was 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 tearing up was, was tearing up cotton and cotton was yeah. king you know yeah. and so how do you so i think it's the for me it is the what 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 is our role our role is to shed light on the shaded regions mm -hmm. don't shed light on the, the agree narrative okay yeah i'm old school you know the first time i called my dad and told my dad you know i was you know i was emotional about what was happening in, in these last couple of years when yeah. we know what's we know what's been happening yeah. and he said to me hey you know he said he's of a different generation where it's basically like hey man you got to get a little backbone you got to mm -hmm. get some backbone mm -hmm. and you gotta and you gotta realize that this uh has been a repeated series of events it doesn't make it right but you know, not being emotional, being factual, knowing the lay of the land. Because you get, you know, you coming from that place, you, it's all, you all kind of just spacey with it. You acknowledge, okay, this is what's happening and how do I conduct myself? I got nieces and nephews. Uh -huh. I have people within my own structure that are leaning on me mm. to be respectful, to be a certain level of integrity, honesty, my grandparents, you know, um, you know, different people who've been in my life who've been influential, they weren't telling me how to be. They were being and I was observing. Mm. And so now I know how to observe. And I know now I'm starting to learn, you know, half of learning when you're when you're a kid, a small kid is observation. They're picking up everything you do. And so I think one of the things, especially with not that I'm so old, but hey, you know, 40 is <laughs> it's barking, you know, it's mm -hmm. like two years around the corner. Mm -hmm. And so I have I have people, young people who, you know, 19, 20, 21 reaching out to me. And I'm like, hey, maybe think about it this way. Maybe don't be so quick to say this is this, this is that or quick to define yourself, but allow everyone to impart things in you. And then you begin to mold a beautiful story and substance behind things mm -hmm. but i think that that's that for me that's one that's been actually education has been one of the things that i started to do during COVID. i had i had a lot of students because number one i didn't I, I always felt like i was still a student that i'm still learning you know yeah. but then during COVID, i kind of i picked up a couple of students and was allowed you know that helped me from a week from a week to week basis be like wow okay this is a this is cool you know and and i'm you know i'm picking up new skill sets and, and doing different things so that i can help i can't help people yeah. beginning of COVID, i was like um it was like the second time second or third time in my life i questioned music and i was mm -hmm. like nah. you know i got people dying in my own family because of this COVID. is this the most this is the right thing for me to be doing, saying how much work am I getting done? Mm -hmm. Or, but then eventually I got to a point where I can't help anybody if my boat is sinking. I can't. If my ship is sinking, so then I started to practice and started to get back on the horn and realizing and, and healing myself in the process. You know, because because nobody knows what this is. Nobody knew what this is. We're still trying to discover what right. this moment in time is and yeah and 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 so so i'm still in that i'm still working in that department bringing it to the community i think that i think this i think stuff is starting to open up um and people are 
you know, I see different musicians I know playing out, outdoor concerts. I played a couple, but I played a couple early on, mm-hmm. um, outdoor things. Um, but, you know, I'm working, I'm also working through my own relationship with the world and my relationship with living in New York City and things being, you know, things, things are being a little, a little different, you know. Yeah. Like, you know, they're a little different now in, in New York City for various things. I mean, some venues closed up, you know, just the amount of uh, different things, you you know, you, when you're playing sax, you're playing an instrument, you're on the subways, you know, different interactions, mm-hmm. you know. And so, so I'm still, they're still trying to get my flow, my flow back. But I definitely think that, that the music, the music has been and will continue to be disseminated via technology yeah. or via but but the curiosity and the nuance and also mm-hmm. controlling and controlling your own narrative yeah yeah mm-hmm. like yeah. i wrote some articles over the over covid i wrote about i wrote three articles on an improvisation composition system i've been working on since 2011 mm-hmm. called molecular system systematic music and then i wrote a satire piece called mm-hmm. the grocery store chronicles nice <laughs> Because I was just like getting tired of music conversation. And so I wanted to talk about some fruits and vegetables and, and you know, how they was getting into it. You know, the tomatoes versus, you know, the grapes and <laughs> yeah. forced pesticides, sure. you know, sure. just different nuances of the conversation Yeah, without pointing a finger to, but being creative in the process. Right. Right on. So, right on. So. <laughs> That's great, man. Yeah, great. yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, I, I I have two more questions for okay, you. Okay, cool. Um, and I try to be a little less. No, nervous. man. You're, the, <laughs> but I'm, I really I'm appreciate. Good. But I really appreciate your questions, man. I mean, really, Thank it's you, been man. really inspiring interview, man. Oh Seriously. man, it's, and a really it's great to hang with you, man. Really refreshing. First of all, yeah, man. You know, we yeah. we should we should keep this going. Even, even no, after. we'll keep it going. We'll keep it going. <laughs> for sure. That's real. That's real, man. When you thought about the unit, this this unit for this project. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm familiar with William Parker, Mm -hmm. Uh, love his legacy, love his playing and learning more and more about him. uh, The older I get the same with, 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 with Chad Taylor. Um, Chris Hoffman, the cellist is actually a new name for me. Right. uh, Right. With with what he's doing. But I wanted to ask you about teaming up with uh, Kirk Nufke uh, in in the front line. Um, I'm most familiar um, I've never met Kirk. He and I have a mutual friend in Charlie Hunter. Kirk was with oh, him. Oh, yeah, yeah. Charlie Hunter. Yeah, Charlie Hunter is a groovy dude, man. Yeah, man. That's, that's I was listening man. to him back in the days, too, man. Yeah. As a teen. I was listening to everybody, man. Yeah, Trust dude. Me. I can tell. <laughs> I can tell, man. But man, I'm I'm I, I really appreciate Kirk's sound, his conception. Right. Right. But man, when you look for uh, a frontline partner, you know, we've right. got all this legacy of all right. these great combinations. Right, right, so right. What right, was right. it about Kirk's thing that spoke to you that said, hey man, he's the right cat for this conception? He's the right guy. Well, you know what? I think number one, I think every all the relationships on the album is just personal connection. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, um, connection over the years. I met, Kirk was one of the first people I met um, when I came to New York in 2012. Yeah. Um, and we just kind of vibe. We used to shed together. Okay. We know to a lot of people. Okay. And um, I think that Kirk also has, you know, he's pretty much self-taught, which, you know, that kind of flavor and nuance it just gives his sound for me. It gives him his sound. I mean, he's this. First of all, this cat is a very learned cat. So mm-hmm. you know, this is no, there's no knock against any anybody or any institution or anything. I'm, I'm talking specifically about Kurt. Uh-huh. Um, it just, I heard a lot of skill, but I also heard a lot of organic. Mm, okay. Okay. You know, a, a, a lot of like the search is still on, you know, and, 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 and not, and then we had similar, you know, Kirk and I have similar music tastes, you know, um, he's from Colorado. You know, I didn't know, I didn't know uh, him while I was in Colorado, but I did know one of his uh, teachers, which is um, Ron Miles. Yeah. Yeah. You see? And so Ron Miles, Ron Miles, man, that dude, He's got a legacy of trumpet players that have studied with him. You see, you got you got Kurt, you got Shane Inslee, you got uh, Nate Woolley. Mm-hmm. You know, 
I mean, and if you check, go check out his stuff. Whew, I mean, <laughs> sure. that, that brother can play. Yes, he can. Um, you know, and 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 he's also been indirect, indirect, direct mentor to me. He sends me words of encouragement and and different things like that. So it was just a vibe, you know. I think mm-hmm. I, I think I've I've vibed with, with many people over the years, but I think, you know, it's. I mean, he played. You know, he's playing a cornet. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I think when I hear Kirk, I hear or I feel like circular, like a circular pattern when he's playing. And maybe that's just my relationship when, when I hear trumpet in general. You know, I think about circles a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we just ha- and, and I think it was the first one of the first times I played with him. We can kind of still have our own thing but milk our sounds into each other. That is hard to find. You know, where, where him and I can play the same note, and you can barely tell that it's, you know, um, two different instruments. Yeah. You know, and I think that that's important. Uh, unless, unless, you know, because I mean, Kirk does have a way of, of playing against, you know, against that sound too. So it's, so even if it's a unison line, you know, he has a way, which is very unique to him, of, of, mm-hmm. of pressing against that. Sure. Um, which I thought was cool. But but basically just just natural, natural vibe, community type experiences, hanging out in Brooklyn, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. yeah. And that's what everybody I mean. The same thing with Chad. I mean, I think I saw Chad playing with Cooper Moore. Hmm. I think it was either Cooper Moore or Darius Jones. But anyways, and I just always loved his playing, you know, and uh, to find people, it's not hard to find people in New York that can play. I mean, come on, everybody can play here. Everybody in this town can play, I mean, really. I mean, that's, that's rare, you know, but pretty much everybody. But I think it, for me, it ends up being like just, just vibe and, and influence and then Finding a cast of people whose musical tastes are this broad, now that's kind of hard. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know, and I I don't know too much music that Kirk can't play. Wow. Wow. You know? And that can be said about anybody in the group, you know. I mean, I want a specific vibe on Lowlands of Sorrow. And uh, and I think Kim or Jean. Mm-hmm. And, and hey, yeah. how many bass players, how many bass players do you know can play the Gimbri? I don't know too many. Right. Right. You know, so I think the skill sets alone. Yeah. You know, but Kirk, he's a, he's a special dude. I mean, and just, you know, just different influences, you know, Charlie Hayden, Don Cherry, you know, Dewey or Nat, you know, we, we, him and I have that commonality, you know, and it sounds in the music, same thing with Chad, you know, me and Chad can, we can spend all day talking about Billy Higgins and Ed Blackwood. Yeah, that's just yeah. our, that's just a, that's just a vibe. But then yeah. Chad, him and I could talk about hip hop. Then we can talk, we can start talking about, I mean, I mean, geez, man, this, let me just say something about Chad. Yeah. This, this dude deserves, this, he needs a little bit more play mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. he is on hundreds of albums. During the, during 2020, I think Chad was on at least 20 albums. Wow. That were released in 2020. Wow. And he also, you know, can write his own music, whatever. But yeah, just all the relationships. And Chad is actually the one who introduced me to to, him. I played with Chris Hoffman one time with Rob. It was a gig I did with this great uh, sax player, uh, Rob Reddy. It was Mm -hmm. Rob Reddy. Oliver Lake was doing poetry. And then I forgot who else was there. But I met Chris there. But then after that, we hadn't played again. Um, So, Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, man. yeah, that's man. cool. Yeah, it's a great Just, man. It's a great man. Thanks, man. thanks. Man. Uh, yeah, Seriously, absolutely, absolutely. And you led me to my last question. Yes, Emergy. Yes. And I was listening to the tune. I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm in this space. Um, it's nourishing, but like, what is this about? I had to look it up. What's, what is actually the right. definition of the word? Right. And we're talking about an industrial use if you will right 
of raw materials. Of raw materials, and yeah. That led me to thinking again, after this pandemic, you know, whenever it's over or, or, or how yeah. we conceptualize getting back to work, mm -hmm. what are some new structures maybe that you would suggest or how can we as, as creative people, people who are hands-on with mm -hmm. our raw materials, mm -hmm. control them more, set up our own institutions to mm -hmm. promote or get them to the community in let's just say a better fashion than maybe the industrial use or the industry mm -hmm. has done. Mm -hmm. That's what it led me to think about. And I just wanted to kind of turn that over to you, you know, as we close, what right. are you thinking about? How are ways that we can use our intellectual uh, uh, property or, or the, the creative that flows through us? Mm -hmm. How can we get that in a, in a more, more pure way in a more artistic way to mm. uh, the folk out there? Well, you know what? Number one, I will say this. I like that raw materials. Yeah, you know, and that's the thing too. I, let me just say just a little bit about that. It's because in studying George Washington Carver, you know, he was known as a chemergist, you know, and it's just like, okay, well, what is that? And that's, that term not even being used anymore. It kind of just fell, fell away. And so when I think about coming out of the COVID and how, you know, I think it's happening mm. now. Okay. You know, the need for us realizing the importance of human interaction. Mm -hmm. from what I can tell just based on people people coming to concerts outside and stuff yeah. needing that that raw that real you know um, vinyl is more mm. popular now than it's mm. ever been you know um, getting books you know you, you talk about raw materials I mean this this internet is this is not raw material. This is like after the raw material. <laughs> this is just like, you know, it's like you have the organic, then you have everything that, that is made out of the organic. Mm -hmm. And and it's just, you know, it, it, it ends up being toxic, ends up being all these different things. So I think coming out of this, you know, spending more time with, with family members, spending more time with family members. I know I spent, I've been, been trying to spend more time mm -hmm. with my family members. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it's interesting. It's interesting, you know. Like I think, I think about this often when you say industry. Mm -hmm. I think one of the facets of Jessup Wagon is that it's pretty raw. It's not, you know, it's not like. I got out of school and made an album, you know? It was coming from a raw place. I wrote the music in a very raw, spiritual kind of mood where I wanted the music itself to reach people on that, on the, on the rawest organic level as possible, you know, even through the medium of music industry you know it's kind of like i've had a i've had i had one opportunity to present this music at the roulette the day the music right. came out right. in brooklyn and that was beautiful you know we had about 25 people there mm -hmm. i mean i think that was the limit um mm -hmm. you know because they have all these limits but i think that raw is synonymous with real you know and real should be a lifestyle. You know, when you're talking to people, I'm 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 as a matter of fact type person. You know, I'm I'm definitely, you know, hey, this is what's going on. It's just like, you know, hey, I musicians have some musicians haven't worked for months. You know, that's right. So so you know, when we get back to, you know, when we get back to economics, it's not about being rich, it's about surviving. And more than surviving, living, you know, like, hey, don't accept these gigs for nothing. People died over these, over the, over, over this music. People died during COVID. Some people lost income. 
and then couldn't afford maybe medications and different things and musicians, and older musicians. And then a lot of people died. So the new narrative should be like, make it count. You put something out, make it count. Yeah. You go play, play like it's your last. Don't play like, don't, cause see, this is the thing. Mm. And I had to, I, I, I had to think about this for, 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 for a little bit. You can't regret anything if you plan it like it's your last. If you play like it's your last time. So I was already prepared mentally that, well, hey, if this is it, well, I, I continue to prepare like it's my last. And I, you know, and, and I think, I think, you know, there's been so many albums that have helped me. You know, I think, I think the purpose of music has been watered down so much that we forget the power of it, really. You know, because, because, you know, you release an album, there's yeah. an album release, you know, people writing reviews, you know, all of these different things. But then we can't lose sight of whether or not it touched that vein or not. You see? Mm -hmm. So I think that it, it, it ceases to be, you know, when I think about, like lately, I've been just reading up on uh, Norman Lewis, who was, who was a black abstract expressionist, mm. you know, uh, along the lines of, you know, he was chilling with the William de Kooning's and Jackson Pollock's and all them, mm -hmm. you know, and Norman Lewis was right there in the thick of it. And then he started wow. that collective with, uh, he started that collective with Romare Bearden called Spiral, you see. And so I look at, I lean on history to give me strength in the moment. So during COVID, I lean on history because maybe something within what I'm reading will resonate. And then that manifests itself outside of the horn. And of course, our medium and mode of expression is to present work. Mm -hmm. The musicians mm -hmm. present music. That's what we do. So our greatest medium is to get the music to the people and you know, if the industry folks, if they like it, cool. But just remember that, you know, does grandmama like it? Does mama like it? Does dad like it? Yeah. Does your siblings like it? You know, getting back to that, you know, it's like you read these stories about musicians and maybe they wrote a song or maybe their parent came to the concert. And that meant more to them than anything. And I saw, I think, COVID for me made me refocus on, okay, who am I playing for? What is this about? What is it about for me? I know what it's not about, you know? I think that, I think that every opportunity to speak on the work and the album is touching people and reaching people, then that's a good thing. That's, that's a great thing. I could get with that. Uh, all the other stuff, you know, mm. hey, the horn is on zero. I say this a lot, but it is. It don't remember accolades. It doesn't remember anything. My only job is to present music of integrity and honesty and to, and, and, and to mean it. Because I'm telling you, people can tell when you don't mean it. They can. Wow. Yeah. They can. I mean, come on. You can tell when somebody is like giving you their all or when they just are going through the motions. So I think it's going to be. My, my thing is you feel this energy and excitement. There's an excitement brewing, you know, and you feel it. Like musicians seem to be like, you know, let's get this music out here. So we're, we're going to see, it's going to be a resurgence, I feel like, of, yeah. of people playing like it's their last time playing because they remember during COVID, hey, we wasn't doing nothing for 14, 18 months, whatever the situation is. So I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. I, I'm 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 a work in progress. Ain't that's what they say in church, right? You know, <laughs> God ain't through with me yet. <laughs> yeah. Same so, here, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so you, yeah. So you know, I definitely this was a. It was easy for me to say yes to this because I, I was familiar with your work and uh, appreciate you. And you know, I'll take it. I'll take it for granted. I'll take anything for granted. 
You know, anybody that wants to talk to me about music, because this is an anomaly, really. Yeah. Sometimes I think about all this as an anomaly. Hey, yeah, I've been to work. Well, there's a bunch of people who put in the work, and they, you don't know, you don't know, in this industry, you don't know who gets the breaks and who doesn't. So anybody who says that they do, they're kind of like lying, you know? Mm. Like, oh, well, you know, this is the path. Well, hey, you know? That's why I'm always bigging up where I'm from, or bigging up people who, you know, there's so many amazing musicians in this in this creative scene, um, and a lot of people who've been who've been pay, paving the way, you know. Um, yeah. They don't. They, you know, they don't get the proper due that they they get while they while they're living. You know. Yeah. Shout out to shout out to, yeah, it's Grover Washington Jr. It's also you know, Elvin Shepard who was his teacher. It's also Charles Gale. It's also Johnny Booth. It's also all these people who contributed directly, indirectly to why I'm able to like be be proud of where I'm from, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. man, that's great. That's yeah. great. Brother. Thank you, man. I'll get you to hang thank on you. just for one quick second. Okay. But it's been my pleasure, man. Thank you, brother. Thank you. No, thank you. And 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 stay in contact, man. I like your energy, man. That's real. You know. Thank you, man. Get, can hit me hit me up anytime.